Welcome to Peak Performance Radio. We're back on today with Dr. Phil Page. He's the Director in Clinical Research and Education of, for Performance Health uh, at Tulane University. Uh, he also uh, sits on the board for and is the Director of Education for TheraBand. And today's conversation will be uh, touching upon various different types of applications in his walks of life along with um, some unique modalities that we'll dive into. So with no further ado, I look forward to this conversation. Uh, Dr. Phil, I, or do you want to be called Phil or Dr. Phil first? So. Phil, fine. What do you prefer? Phil's fine, okay. I never want to assume because I know it's hard work to get your, uh, your PhD and, and to be a teacher and whatnot. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for jumping on this call. Uh, secondly, uh, I ask all my, my initial questions around uh, the theme of the podcast, which is about peak performance. How do we enhance peak performance uh, in many different applications? So when you hear that term, what does it mean to you? Well, performance for me uh, obviously uh, relates to being able to um, accomplish something or perform at a certain level to do something, whether it's a, a sporting technique or it could be something you do at work, how well you perform at work. So being at your peak performance is being able to give your highest effort with the highest uh, outcome that you're trying to attain. Thank you. Uh, it's, always, it's always interesting to hear uh, the different perspectives and comments on how people define it or what do they consider it to be because at the end of the day, it really applies to the environment you put it in uh, or apply it in. In your, in, in your uh, applications, when you're doing uh, training or you're applying or teaching uh, future students, what are some things that you would recommend to them as far as uh, books uh, or people that you would recommend to help them get a head start their uh, career. Are you talking about for uh, performance enhancement in athletics? Uh, I'm just talking about, yes, we'll, we'll start with performance enhancement in athletics, but then, uh, for, for example, let's say a person who had aspirations of being a teacher as well, what would be some recommendations there as well? Uh, it's kind of put me on the spot. There's so many good resources. I, 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 I have a lot of books personally. I I tend to keep a lot around and and use not just one resource but a lot um, because every book has uh, some some good characteristics and that's good characteristics. I, it depends on again the uh, when when you look at a book, the more focused the book is, the better. So when you're looking for a book to help you to go in a certain direction. Try to find the book that fits that niche as closely as possible. A lot of times we have textbooks that we pick up in school, and they are very, very broad and have a lot of information. But, you know, the problem with textbooks is that the information is actually quite dated. By the time that you get um, a textbook published, it could be usually two years from the time it's actually written to the time that it's actually in someone's hands. And by that time, we have a whole different, sometimes different perspective uh, from a scientific basis. So while a textbook is good, it wouldn't be my go-to for the most current information. But in terms of stepping away from the professional sports side, you know, I do have some uh, really good uh, books from a, uh, I guess, a business management perspective that I like uh, that give you a lot of life lessons from business, but you can apply it to working with clients and patients on a daily basis. For example, uh, Delivering Happiness, it's mm -hmm. great, uh, Predictably Irrational. Those are some of my, uh, my top books that I like to uh, recommend for someone who wants to kind of uh, see a different perspective outside of the academic world and how we can um, apply our behaviors in the, the business world with clients to uh, make their performance better as well. Oh, thank you. Would you recommend, who are the people that you, impacted you specifically on your career path 
uh, as well as uh, in the industry that you would like to share? Well, I always, I always go back to my mentors. I think the, the most important part of developing into a professional is the experiences, both positive and negative, that you have. And uh, as everyone else has, I've had some really good experiences and some really bad experiences. So you can have good mentors and bad mentors to where you kind of learn what not to do. I tend to not uh, talk about those um, with other people, but what I do like to give credit to are certain people that have had a major influence uh, on me, and it's as far back in my career, uh, which I started uh, in athletic training. My, my first um, my first mentors were at uh, LSU, and I uh, worked with uh, Dr. Marty Broussard, who was one of the founding fathers of the NATA, uh, and I was a uh, uh, student trainer with him. Also, John Purdy, uh, who's now at uh, Vanderbilt Sports Medicine, got to work with uh, Stratton Caratophis at Mississippi State, on all the way to the professional football, uh, where I worked with Dean Kleinschmidt and um, Jimmy Whitehill and John Kasich with Seattle Seahawks. Um, those were kind of my, my influences through the athletic training side. And then uh, as a physical therapist, probably the, the biggest influence on my career was Dr. Vladimir Yanda from the Czech Republic, who uh, really changed the way that I look at uh, uh, patients, clients, exercises. It totally changed my perspective um, as a physical therapist and kind of led me down the path that I've chosen, which is um, focusing on uh, the, the real practical application of science and how do we um, translate the messages that we see uh, in, in the clinics, how do we explain them with science, and how can we use science to help direct the way that we address our patients and our clients. Uh, let, let's dive into that right there, um, the beyond the approach. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more? Uh, on the, the uh, Vladimir Yanda's approach? Sure. Dr. Yanda was a uh, physician. He's actually a neurologist. But uh, before that, he was a physical therapist uh, in uh, former Soviet uh, Czechoslovakia. And in the 1960s, he was working on his uh, uh, dissertation, if you will, and uh, was uh, observing the uh, neurologic basis for chronic musculoskeletal pain, in particular uh, low back pain. He would have patients that had low back pain in a bed in a hospital that were right next to patients who had cerebral palsy or, or a stroke because in, in the, the Soviet and Czechoslovakia, as a neurologist, you had to see both types of patients constantly. And, of course, being in Czechoslovakia, there, there weren't fancy machines uh, like MRIs and uh, Biodex machines and all the fancy things that we have. So uh, he had to rely on his experience, his observations. He was a very, very astute observer. That was probably the biggest, biggest attribute of Dr. Yamba was his ability to see things that others couldn't. And that's kind of where he was able to see what the influence of the central nervous system was on the musculoskeletal system and recognize that those two systems couldn't be separated functionally, that that they are, they are dependent on each other, not independent, which kind of goes a, a little bit against what we learn in anatomy class and physiology, where we learn about their, their function separately, but in reality, we can't separate the two. And so what he started to observe were these uh, characteristic patterns in the patients who had uh, chronic back pain, had the same muscle tightness and weakness that patients with cerebral palsy had. Uh, so what he had um, uh, identified was that the central nervous system was actually causing these perpetuated muscle imbalances in chronic pain, so that the, the brain was actually causing the problem, not the back itself. And traditionally, we would treat the back and treat the back, and it, would, it may, may feel a little bit better, but it never really got better. And what he started doing was recognizing that we need to train the brain. So we, he started with uh, rocker and wobble board exercises for back patients and developed a program called sensory motor training. That's a progressive system of balance training and stabilization that he implemented with chronic neck and back patients um, to help them in their rehabilitation. 
And the way that he was able to identify this some group of patients who had chronic back and neck pain were through his trademark cross syndromes. He was the clinician that actually made that observation and coined the term cross syndromes where he saw characteristic patterns of muscle tightness and weakness uh, in the neck, uh, in the upper quarter and the lower quarter that were also associated with poor posture, uh, poor movement patterns. And what he was teaching was that it's the central nervous system that's maintaining these cross syndromes. And so if we simply address the muscles themselves or the joints themselves, that's not where the, the entire problem is. The problem is manifested in the musculoskeletal system, but it's actually modulated by the central nervous system. And a lot of what he said was not proven at the time. Now what we're seeing is a lot more evidence through things like functional MRI that patients with chronic pain, such as low back pain, fibromyalgia actually do have changes in their brain which identify the fact that there is something to the fact that central nervous system is mediating these chronic musculoskeletal pain syndromes. And if we don't treat them differently than we normally would, they'll, they won't get better. Upper body and lower cro uh, body cross syndrome is, is, kind of, is, is been used quite often in the um, fitness arena. So. Let's apply it there. Um, I know, you know, by trade, you're, you 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 worked as a physical therapist. What are some things, you know, typically from the personal training side? Most, you know, they always they were always taught to stretch the tighten side and to strengthen the uh, opposite side. But because of certain protective mechanisms that you described, i.e., the central nervous system, sometimes it's harder to stretch a muscle. Uh, what are some things that using that modality that uh, maybe uh, an instructor could grasp? Obviously, there's going to be requirements to get more further education, but how does that apply? Do you have any comments on that? Well, the first thing, is Yonda had a four-step approach to his cross syndrome. The, the most important thing is if you have a cross syndrome that's causing pain, Obviously, a physical therapist should be involved in the care to promote kind of a team approach. If, a, if there is a personal trainer that recognizes it, they should uh, be able to partner with somebody in the community that does recognize these and values the, the team approach of physical therapists and personal trainers working together. Uh, because once you start having pain with something, there's obviously something going on. People can have poor posture and actually appear to have what some people may call cross syndrome, but they probably but, but they may not. It's it's sometimes misused in terms of the terminology. Uh, what you it, by definition the cross syndrome has to have the characteristic patterns of tightness and weakness on the uh, on the dorsal side and the ventral side of the front and the back of the body. If they don't, if for example someone just has isolated tightness and weakness of, of certain muscles, they don't have cross syndrome. And you can use the example of shoulder impingement, for example. Yonda would say that um, the, the syndrome or upper cross syndrome has uh, weak lower trap, tight upper trap, um, uh, weak deep neck flexors, and tight pectoralis. Well, if someone doesn't have weakness of the deep neck flexors, then they don't have a true upper cross syndrome. They just have isolated muscle tightness and weakness. And once we identify the true, the true presence of a cross syndrome, the first step in the process is to normalize proprioception. And the way that we do that is by making sure we're in a good posture. Uh, as a manual therapist, we can do some joint mobilization techniques, uh, anything to help increase the proprioception because it's the afferent input that has a strong influence on what the muscles are doing. The next step that we do is to restore muscle balance by just what you said, which is to stretch the tight muscles and strengthen the weak muscles. The problem there is that you have to know what's causing the tightness and the weakness. Because sometimes you can have, there's, there's probably six different types of tightness and weakness that are out there. Uh, for example, you may have reciprocal inhibition. Uh, you may have a muscle that's tight and weak at the same time. 
So in Yanda's approach, and we go through this in the textbook that, uh, that we wrote on his approach, there's several things that you need to be able to identify uh, in terms of what's causing it because once you identify um, what's causing the uh, tightness or weakness, that will dictate your type of treatment. Most commonly, what Yandu would talk about was you always stretch the tight muscle first. There's different stretching techniques. Maybe a, um, a typical low load prolonged stretch. It could be a contract relax. It could be a post isometric relaxation. Again, there's many different techniques that we can use to address muscle tightness. At the same time, there's a lot we can do to address muscle weakness. What's interesting in the syndrome is that most, many times, the tight muscle is actually inhibiting the weak muscle. So once we release the tight muscle, its antagonist to is weak, resolves itself to be strong again. And in reality, it wasn't weak in the first place. It was just inhibited. So there's a difference between being truly weak and being truly inhibited, meaning that a muscle that's weak would respond to strengthening, whereas a muscle that's inhibited would not respond to any strengthening. So if you're strengthening over and over and over again this muscle, if it's inhibited, it'll never get strong again. So if you have a, a situation where you have a, a client or an athlete that's just not getting any stronger, look at the other side and see if you have a reciprocal inhibition situation. And then the third step that we do when addressing um, Yonda syndrome is to perform the sensory motor training that I mentioned earlier which is where we do progressive balance training using unstable surfaces. And in reality, it's what I call a vertical stabilization exercise, where instead of doing um, uh, bird dogs and the different stabilizations that we do on a mat, Yonda would have you focus on uh, cervical and lumbar stabilization while standing on unstable surfaces and moving the extremities. Uh, and the last step, the fourth step in the approach is to increase the endurance in the coordinated movement or the functional movement patterns just by repeating the movements over and over and over again. So to, to kind of summarize, you're right, you do want to stretch the tight muscles first and work on strengthening the weak muscles, but again, it depends on what's causing that, that weakness, uh, sorry, that tightness, which will dictate what type of stretching intervention would be best for the client. I hope personal trainers take a really hard listen to that. Um, that's great information to share and, and to really grasp and understand the type of technique that you have at your in your toolbox, but understand that you should most importantly be working with medical practitioners such as physical therapists, uh, doctors that are that can tell you and help you in your program design. You've mentioned different modalities. You've talked about applications. Um, let's talk a little bit about myofascial release. Um, there's a lot of uh, things that are happening in the industry. A lot of new devices came out, styrofoam rollers, different types of devices that work on giving a massage type of or self type of massage to uh, your muscle, uh, and it causes a certain type of effect. Um, sometimes people call it flexibility training. Sometimes people call it mobility training. Can you define it and talk a little bit about it? It all comes down to movement, and movement is what is really the, the hot topic nowadays. It's not just can we go through a range of motion, it's can we do it properly. And so the key to good movement patterns, first of all, comes in the ability to, it, it kind of, it, it carries over into Yonda's approach of treatment. Good movement is based on good proprioception, uh, normal muscle balance, uh, appropriate stabilization, and then endurance. And so when you apply those four principles to movement, you can start to see where the deficits might come from. When you're talking about myofascial, myofascial is actually uh, what I would consider to be part of the, the muscle tightness or the lack of, of motion portion of movement. So in order to do a movement pattern, we obviously have to have um, the, the range of motion, we have to have the, the muscle activation. We have to have the proprioception for the feedback. And those three uh, things are interplaying constantly when it comes to movement. But without the range of motion, you really don't have movement. So if we take range of motion uh, or just the range of movement, I guess, would be a better 
um, classification. I can take that and say, what's causing the limitation of movement? And the first thing that we look at from a, from a structural perspective is what's happening at the joint. So when we talk about joint mobility, that's the first thing. The second thing that we look at is muscle length. How long is the muscle when we're talking about its ability to um, provide movement through a range of motion, both through extensibility and contract, contractility? Um, and so we need to be able to address muscle length. And the third thing is the myofascial aspect, which actually does play a little bit into muscle length. But I separate out myofascial because it's more of a fascial question that we're talking about. When we look at muscle length, there's a contractile and a non-contractile component to it. The contractile component of muscle length obviously relates to its, its uh, resting tone, its uh, activation level. And when we have a muscle that's tight, because of a neurologic uh, tightness, then we can use contract relax or uh, post-isometric relaxation, te relaxation techniques. If I've got a muscle that, that's tight because of non-contractile components, that would actually be fascial, myofascial in nature because the muscle itself is enveloped in fascia, and the fascia then is connected to itself throughout the rest of the body. Remember that, that right underneath our skin is the superficial fascia, which is interconnected from head to toe. And then we have the deeper fascia, which is actually enveloping the muscles and creating compartments, if you will. So back to understanding the real reason why we want to increase movement, what's the restriction to the movement? Is it the joint? Is it the muscle? Or is it the fascia? So in order to determine that, I have to do some type of assessment. And one of the, the popular things that, that we're using today is, is called Selective Functional Movement Assessment, or SFMA, which helps me to understand why they can't move. Is it a, um, is it a neurologic mobility, uh, sorry, is it a stability problem or is it a mobility problem? If it's a mobility problem, then I need to know, is it because the muscle's tight? Is it because the joint's restricted? Or is it because the fascia is tight? So what's happened now is within the past five to seven years, we used to think fascia was an inert tissue that wasn't living, but, and we would cut through it in our cadavers. But nowadays what we're seeing is that when we do histological analysis and, and actually look at fascia, it's, it's, a, it's a living tissue that actually has pain receptors, it has fibroblasts in it, and it has mechanoreceptors in it. So it's actually sending information into our central nervous system on our movement. And wow. it, it not only is restricting movement or guiding movement from a structural perspective, but because it does have mechanoreceptors and nociceptors in it, it's actually giving information to the brain to say, hey, you're moving this direction or this is painful. And so that's why now people are all of a sudden going back and saying, hey, fascia is an important thing. And what happens is because it has fibroblasts in it, those are the cells that produce collagen. And if we stimulate them, they produce collagen. And if they overproduce collagen, what happens is you develop adhesions. And so that's where tish, the, the fascia sometimes gets restricted because it may have had a tweak or something and the fibroblasts are starting to lay down collagen. And so what's become popular nowadays is the, the foam rolling and uh, roller massagers uh, and myofascial techniques. You know, myofascial release has been around for years and years and years, but it wasn't, the, the, it's not the same as what we're seeing today, which is actually using these foam rollers. What's really cool about these rollers is one of my friends, uh, Dr. David Bame, who's at the uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland in Canada, uh, with he and his colleague Dwayne Button, the faculty there, are the first to do research on foam rolling that shows wow. that when we do foam rolling techniques and even roller massager techniques where we're rolling the uh, roller massager over the, the muscle and the fascia, we're seeing almost immediate increases in range of motion in the joints with no decrease in muscle performance. So what you're seeing is the muscle is actually getting warmed up and lengthened, which is what you would want to see with a static stretch. But the problem with static stretching is that when we stretch statically, it affects our performance. So 
if I do a static stretch and then measure someone's vertical jump, they're going to be less able to jump. If I do a sprint and then I uh, do a stretch, static stretch, they sprint again, they're going to be slower. We know that static stretching affects ballistic movements acutely. And so what Dr. Bang and Dr. Button are showing is that if you just do a simple foam roller or a roller massager for a few seconds, anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds, you're going to see sometimes 10% increase in range of motion with no problems, no, no, no effect on muscle performance. So if you're on the sideline and you want to get a quick warm-up but you don't want to stretch because you're a jumping athlete like a basketball player, just use a, a roller massager on your quad, on your Achilles, on your hamstrings, and you'll see an increase in range of motion, but you won't get that decrease in muscle performance. Well, oh, I, I, you know, for the YouTube people that, and the uh, iTunes people that are hearing this, it, um, you know, you, you, to, to put it uh, in, a, in, in a simple way, is, uh, it disinhibits your capabilities to do uh, explosive activity, static stretching, or traditional old school type of stretching by using new devices like the roller, uh, you're able to increase range of motion, So, it, but it does not it cause the, uh, that feedback mechanism in your brain to take away the elastic components of the muscle. Uh, so you know, that's valuable information to have uh, from an athletic standpoint. Any, any athlete can benefit from it, and there's now a lot of different devices that come into play. Let's talk a little bit about um, your your um, your role with Theraband, um, and Theraband it, it uh, creates a lot of different products as well. Uh, uh, one specific product, and I always get arguments with, is you can't get strong with Thera with elastic bands. Um, what are, what's your thoughts on that? that's the the biggest falsehood I've ever heard? Um, there. With my job with Airband, which I've been uh, the director of research and education for 15 years, my primary job is to provide evidence behind the product. And I've actually written the only textbook on elastic resistance uh, uh, 10 years ago when we first showed that it is unequivocally true that you do get strong from using elastic resistance bands. There, We have over a 1,000 references in our database and probably over 100 randomized controlled trials just with Theraband brand that do show these improvements and these benefits of elastic resistance training. The, the, probably the, the biggest uh, reason why that, that, uh, that uh, myth has been perpetuated is because the elastic bands that are used in rehab are obviously less resistant than you would see in a fitness environment. And so fitness trainers and, and those types of individuals who are really focused on isotonic resistance, and the big machine companies, they're going to perpetuate that as well. What's interesting is that since I do follow the literature, uh, the, within the past probably three, uh, let's say four years, there have been more articles comparing elastic and isotonic resistance than the past 25 years, which actually show that you get the same benefits both with strength outcomes, actual blood levels of hormones uh, that are indicators of hypertrophy. You get the same exact training response when you match the intensity of the elastic band with the isotonic machines. So what we're showing you is that it's not about is it elastic or is it isotonic. It's all about the intensity. And the muscle doesn't really know if it's elastic or isotonic or whatever. What it knows is resistance is resistance, and I've got to overcome this resistance. And as long as I'm able to overcome this intensity, I'm going to get the same results, whether I'm on a machine or a barbell or an elastic band. It all comes down to intensity. I hope everyone understands that. We could finally put that to bed. Unfortunately, I don't think it's that simple. It, uh, I often I, I tell individuals that uh, when I've trained people, uh, people that work uh, for that travel a lot for work, typically my gym in the bag is always using a band uh, because of it takes up very little space. It is very, very. Uh, it's a device that you could apply in various different types of exercises. Uh, one band could, you know, can train your whole body quite simply. 
uh, you know, again, it's all about the volume and the intensity of work equals a specific training load. And if you if you're if you're principle based and you're using a, a simple process of specificity and progressive overload, a band will do the job. So um, I I use it. I love it. I'm glad to have you share that information. You're also seeing now, which is real interesting, is a combination of the free weights with bands uh, added as well to basically take advantage of uh, of uh, the uh, I guess the, more really the um, the, the strength curve of where you're the strongest uh, and then where you're the weakest. Uh, so um, what are your thoughts on combining free weights and band exercises as well? Yeah, that's also a popular technique um, to add bands uh, in both for resistance and assistance or chains or anything else. And basically what's happening is it's overloading the muscle in a different part of the movement and the range of motion. Um, in general, I, I think that the literature, and the, the literature isn't that there's not much out there. There's probably a half dozen articles that I'm aware of that look at elastic resistance combined with isotonic movements and and do have some evidence that it improves power. But it, 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 for me, it really goes back to what you're trying to accomplish. If you, if you are looking for power, that may or may not be the best thing to do. I would tend to probably look at, at performance of power activities that involve speed a little bit differently than that. But um, it, it really goes back down to um, safety as well. And once you're adding these different gadgets and movements and techniques, it's more for the body to manage, and therefore there's a higher uh, risk of injury. So I always have to weigh the risk and benefit of doing those types of interventions. Like I said, for me, I, I'm... I personally don't know that I feel as comfortable doing those added types of, of uh, resistance training uh, just from a safety perspective. So I would probably choose other methods like more sports-specific training or, or other te techniques to try to, to accomplish that goal. It makes complete sense. You, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what's the risk and what's the reward of, of the choice? But I think what people should understand is that, that – what, you know, every device is a, is a tool that you should uh, uh, consider using in your in your programming. Uh, does does Theraband provide uh, certification courses or educational courses uh, to practitioners such as uh, physical therapists or personal trainers? We don't we don't have a certification by the by the word of, of being certified. Uh, we do offer some education courses for physical therapy. We're uh, starting to do more with uh, performance and fitness. Uh, down the road, we're looking at that. What we tend to do is we, we work with other speakers who provide certifications to help teach them the scientific basis of elastic bands, of balance and myofascial tools. So um, there, there may be others out there who are actually doing certifications using our products. No, it's a very valuable um, technology. I feel that, as you said, it's, been, it's, not, it's not necessarily that new. It's been around for a couple of years. Uh, it took some time, I, I guess, to get more mainstream. You've heard a lot uh, as far as you know. You continuously, obviously, are, are well-read. What are some things, in the, like, for example, some things in the industry right now are really uh, marketing high frequency, high intensity all the time. What are your thoughts uh, on on uh, on those types of methods of training um, being pushed into the market? Obviously, being a PT, you might be a little excited because you might see a lot more people. But what's your common idea you know, when you hear people are trying new new people that are just new to working out have decided to do. Uh, and I don't want to mention brand names, but high frequency and high intensity modalities. I don't know if you're you're re referring to the technique of high intensity training HIT, or are you talking no. about those branded programs that you don't want me to mention the name of? <laughs> well, I, I just don't want to. I don't want to come across as a. I want to. You know, I don't want to come across to the community as I'm trying to bash. Because um, I, I feel like okay, I'll say it. CrossFit, in, uh, Insanity, and P90X. Um, they have their places for the certain uh, for a certain community 
but there have to be specific requirements for that community. I think there's some benefits out of doing their high intensity and high frequency models. But what are your thoughts on, you know, helping, because the biggest problem right now we have is obesity, diabetes, and sedentary lifestyles. I, you know, again, this is per, my disclaimer here. Personally, I wouldn't throw uh, my aunt, my uncle, my grandparents, a good friend of mine, right away into insanity or P90X. You as an educator, you as a uh, therapist and a practitioner, what do you feel, you know, is your comments on a lot of these modalities when people ask you about them? Um, it, it's my response is typically the same thing that you thought I would say, uh, which is I don't particularly like those programs because they do create a lot of injury. Um, it is good, uh, you know, the joke is it's good for physical therapists because it creates a lot of patients. The problem that I have with it, and, and you had mentioned it a little bit about obesity and that stuff, this is nowhere near a solution for obesity and inactivity. It's a fad. All of these fitness programs, these diets, none of them are sustained. Everyone's looking for the next big thing. The TV infomercials are promoting it, and then people are seeing these great results. I don't know of anybody that's still doing CrossFit or Insanity after a, a year or two, and that's not going to fix the obesity problem. The only way to fix the obesity problem is through behavioral change and by changing habits and creating lifestyle choices. And there's no way that anyone can continue to work out at that intensity for a long period of time. We need to be promoting things like not eating junk food, like just participating in an enjoyable, moderate physical activity for 30 minutes a day. That's the key. Because the problem, again, with lifestyle modification is you have to have something that's sustainable and enjoyable. And if you want to, you know, do a quick quick hit and do some, uh, some of those types of trainings, that's fine. It may get you to look a little bit better, but I guarantee it's not something you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. And the most important thing, as you alluded to, is the reason why I think there's so many injuries that people have extremely poor, poor uh, mechanics. And what happens is when you're doing high-intensity training, your, your goal is to finish the reps. And what happens with individuals is that they, they will fatigue before they fail. So I want to emphasize that point is that fatigue occurs before failure. If you're going to failure, you've already fatigued. And if you fatigue, you have lost your movement pattern. So you're actually performing poor movements if you're going to failure at the end of the motion, which is at the end of the, the set, which is going to lead to more injuries. And so in these types of environments and these types of training programs, the goal is really to finish with as much weight as fast as you can. That's totally different than high-intensity training, interval training, or HIT, uh, where we're actually working at high, high intensities for very short periods of time, but we're not going to failure. We're going in very short bursts. And so what we, what we, can, what we do know from the literature is that high-intensity short bursts are pretty much on par with the low load endurance type things for the results that you get, it still goes back to the amount of, of physical activity and metabolic equivalence that we're working out at, but you don't go to failure, so you don't have the injury risk that you would have with those other fatty kinds of, of exercise programs that are popping up everywhere. And who knows what the, the level of education is of the individuals who are doing those types of trainings. Uh, you, you, just, you just never know what you're going to get sometimes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, to, to really wrap this all up, um, are there any, are there any um, projects that, that you're working on that you would like to share or talk about, any speaking events in the future that maybe someone can um, have an opportunity to hear you at in the future? Do you provide the Yonder Approach workshops for hands-on healthcare providers? 
uh, we, where we uh, do a two-day seminar on how to evaluate and treat muscle imbalances. Uh, we also teach some of the TheraBand courses in active care. Um, I am speaking at the uh, uh, Sports Physical Therapy Conference in December uh, on uh, adolescent uh, training. Uh, so uh, it, it just keeps popping up. Um, lots of, of, uh, of uh, seminars and speeches here and there. What's your um, What's the URL that people could uh, follow? Could, could log on and see this for you? Uh, my My website is uh, drphilpage.com dot com or dr p h i l p a g e dot com. Awesome. Uh, well, you know, I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I think you shared a lot of great information. Uh, hopefully, people can understand a little bit more about myofascial work, uh, a little bit more about the Yanda approach. I encourage people to really grasp and understand different types of modalities, to be open, to seek, uh, seek out professionals that know the product and uh, not only know the product, but are, are teachers and trainers that have had many years of experience. And again, this opportunity has been great. Uh, I hope to uh, invite you maybe back to do uh, a, a follow-up to this conversation. Uh, we can maybe elaborate a little bit more on, on uh, an application specifically maybe to the adolescent population. I um, would love to introduce you potentially to the uh, uh, a couple of our other speakers and do a roundtable discussion. Um, the the FIFRO obesity and and diabetes is very real, and I feel that people that can educate uh, really need to have an avenue and an opportunity to connect to the community, and I hope I could um, help you out in that regard. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's good to talk to you today. Yeah, it was great, and uh, uh, we will um, – 